Okay, we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Troy Rosencrantz. Uh, I am the GIS and data manager at the University of Michigan Flint uh, within the Office of Economic Development. Uh, and welcome to International GIS Day. Uh, today, uh, this afternoon, we'll be uh, talking uh, about leveraging GIS and data in placemaking. Uh, so I have a couple housekeeping things. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we will I'll be posting that on our website after uh, uploading it to YouTube after uh, sometime th uh, today or tomorrow. Um, and be sharing that uh, via social media um, if you want to share it with anybody else or, or for viewing afterwards. Um, type your questions at any point uh, or comments in, in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, I'll be monitoring it as, as our speakers talk um, so that we can uh, get to that towards the end uh, during discussion and Q&A time. Um, there will be a post-event survey, and I'm going to post that right now in the chat. Um, I will post in the chat at some point. I forgot that I copied something else. Um, so that will be also in the email that will come out, I think, tomorrow. Uh, kind of a post-event uh, email. Uh, so please fill that out. Uh, if you fill it out, you will be entered in a drawing to get a free one-year subscription. Uh, Esri, as being a part of GIS Day, Azure provides uh, five free subscriptions to us to then hand out as we deem fit. Uh, it's for a subscription for personal use, it's a hundred dollar value. Basically you get access for an entire year to uh, an advanced license of ArcGIS. Uh, so the desktop software, um, ArcGIS Pro uh, and an ArcGIS online account um, that you can use uh, to kind of get your feet wet with GIS if you've never used it before um, or to use it uh, as you see fit for, for personal use. Um, so with that today, uh, we have uh, three uh, people that have joined us uh, today. Uh, Joseph Strapani, the Executive Director for Flint Public Art Project, will, will speak first and talk about how he used, used data and GIS within that project, uh, putting murals up across Flint uh, and into Grand Blank, which is, leads me to Christina Irwin, who's the Assistant City Manager uh, for the City of Grand Blank. And also we have Damon Ross joining us. Uh, from the Community Foundation of Greater Flint uh, to kind of discuss uh, his work with data and GIS, uh, potential work within neighborhood uh, small grant program that they have um, in terms of placemaking uh, at the local level uh, with that. So without further ado, uh, Joe, uh, go ahead and I will stop the share and you can go ahead and share your screen. Let me unmute myself here. And share that. Let's see. Let's see if I can go. Everybody see that? Yep. All right. So, please, we're going to be talking about uh, GIS data in the Euro project uh, here in Flint and Grand Blanc and surrounding cities throughout uh, Genesee County. Um, over the last three years, we have installed 217 murals throughout uh, Flint and Genesee County. The majority of them, I think there are 200 and, uh, 200 in Flint itself and about 202 in Flint itself. So a couple of years ago, we added the Pixel Sticks app onto the murals, which gives us a lot of data from how people use um, how people view the murals. It also is a good way to activate and help uh, bring more attention to some of the murals. So if you download the app, you can go to the map, you can get all the information from different on the different artists, you can get local maps of everything of all the murals here and other cities that the Pixel Sticks is in. <clears throat> so you guys have probably seen these popping up on murals, which are these plaques that give you the artist name, the website, and their information. So when you touch your phone with the Pixel Sticks app open, these little sensors on the back would get pull up that information on your cell phone, but it also gives us data about who's you know when people are looking at murals. <clears throat> so some of the data that we have. It will show you some of the most populated uh, murals that people look at. 
the larger the circle, the more people that are looking at those murals. And you see the ones downtown, which have had the big stick cap on it longer. Downtown Flint have had more people, of course, looking at them. <clears throat> looking at a smaller area, zooming it in, you can see that the downtown area, which murals are viewed more to the pixel sticks app from where they're looking at them. You have more traffic here in Buckham Alley than we do in Rush Alley. Um, right here, there's a concentration of a bunch of murals. The small one, to be fair, on the small little circle that was just done this year. And the other, the first one over here, I don't know if you can see where my cursor is, that one was done in 2019. The other two that had, with the big circle on it, the other were done in 2020. <clears throat> Again, on uh, Martin Luther King Avenue, these were just installed this year, but those are growing pretty good. The MLK mural with um, the Selma Walk and the Obama mural, and then the one up here uh, just north of Pasadena has been, those are the ones that are looked at actually the most here. Um, <clears throat> these are kind of an idea of how many people, I'm not sure if this is in the way or not, but how many, these are the top 50 murals and which ones are looked at the most, how many viewers. So you have a little over 116 people looking at uh, the one at Blackstones, the one at the Ennis Center, the one at the Dryden Building, and the bright colored one in um, Buncombe Alley. And th this is pretty much the order of which ones are the best, or which ones are the highest looked at. <clears throat> uh, 468, if you look up on the top, visitors looked at 985 murals. I made 985 visits to the mural. So that means one, one user um, uh, visited, or not visited, but um, those are individual visits. Total murals that they looked at were 700, or 7,073, sorry. Um, and that's kind of gives you an idea of how many people are looking at the murals. <coughs> So over the last couple of years, we also did get graphs out of here to find out when people are. So then what, it, what programming is working. So if you see where it's really standing out high and tall there, that was the launch of the mural plays. So that day we had mural plays going on along with mural tours. And these were, this is kind of showing you there was a lot of people downtown looking at murals on that day. You break that information, and this is where we can look for trends. <clears throat> so the pixel stick usage over 2021, this shows you uh, what people are looking at, how many murals they're looking at. Again, you can look at the trends. One of the neat things about these trends is if you look during COVID, when you go and line these dates up, all the spikes, we're during lockdowns. When it goes down, this is when things started opening, restaurants started opening back up. You had another little lockdown where they started shutting things down. Things started opening up, another lockdown. And so that trend kind of followed, followed through. Um, the other information that it also gives me is it tells me where you're at and what murals you looked at during that visit. So <clears throat> during some of these trends where the mural view it, viewing has gone down, people looked at mur uh, fewer murals, but they took breaks and a lot more breaks in between. There was a few people that we noticed went to Soggy Bottom and looked at that mural and an hour and a half later looked at the one across the street. Odds are they stopped had lunch at Soggy Bottom and then watch across the street. So now this is showing me patterns of what people are, how people are viewing the murals. <clears throat> over the last, uh, or over the last few years, we've had a lot of 
request. Uh, so this year, uh, a different thing. So we put in a lot of murals over the last few years. And this year we were able to start putting in some kind of different style murals and adding some different looks to the to the environment. Uh, or the Flint, I don't know, Flint and Genesee County uh, mural collection. <clears throat> so we've added more stencil work. We've added uh, pointillism. We've added some graffiti style that really high end graffiti style that really makes things stand out. These are all 2021, except for the MLK, uh, 2021 murals. And so I can also track all these on an individual basis. So I can also look at the uh, data of one single mural and see what the traction is on that one single mural. Or I can check out the data on one single artist and see what the data looks like for that one artist. It's, it's kind of really cool. So it gives us more leverage now that we can use when we go for funding to say, this is what it does, this is what it's doing for your business. And <clears throat> one of the things with the trends, which got us to going into Grand Blank and Burton and other cities, um, was we noticed people are coming to downtown shopping and they're going and looking at other, other stores or other murals and they're crossing these paths that people don't usually cross. So one of the ideas is to expand out into the outer cities. So people start going back and forth and people that might go to Grand Blank and just do all the shopping in Grand Blank, they look at the murals, they open up the Pixel Sticks app and they say, oh, wow, look, there's 50 more in downtown Flint. Let's go look at those. Let's go to this part of Flint and start looking at those. And people in Flint are like, oh, let's go look at these ones there and get people to cross uh, borders and lines that they normally wouldn't cross. Awesome. That actually kind of uh, answered I did. I was going to have a quick question for you. It was about how you were going to use this uh, in the future in terms of um, using this type of data, using this type of mapping capability to uh, look into future locations, you know, as you get more artists or different artists or same artists, obviously, you know, if they wanted to do a different mural, you know, how you chose those, those locations. Um, now you've, the, obviously you probably get the permission okay. from the business owner to put them on there, but uh, is that kind of what your process is going forward? Well, it, 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 it helps us with location. The design on the mural, it's always been my our theory and my theory that I don't, I, even though I live in Flint and in, in Genesee County, I don't live in every neighborhood. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to go every day and look at the mural down the street from your house. You're the one that's going to do that. And so you guys need to, we need to work with those people, with people in those areas to help tell us what they want to see every day. And so we do a lot of community workshops. We did quite a few with Grand Blank to come up with the artist and come up with the themes and the everything that's going on, done it with MLK neighborhood and majority of the neighborhoods around here. So we, we, we like to work with the community to have them give us a guidance. Um, there's a lot of mural, murals or mural artists that I might not have picked if it was just me, but that's not always my choice, so. Um. I also, I just had a thought about, uh, oh shoot, now I lost it. Oh, what made you decide that you wanted to use this Pixel Sticks app? Uh, or if you had you seen it deployed somewhere else or did yes. it kind of just, re somebody reach out to you or what? So the, the person that created it reached out to me. They've been using it a lot in St. Petersburg for the Shine Mural Festival. And he reached out to me in the middle of the 2019 season and at that time, I was like, okay, things were a little crazy. We did 104 murals in six months. And I don't know if you guys know all the artists stay at my house when they, when they come and visit. So not, not only do I have a, you know, running yeah. around, plus I do a day, network a day job, I also have three to five artists living in my house. Um, so <laughs> we, so, 
in the fall, what it, first thing that attracted me to it is like, okay, here's a quick and easy way to make a map. Okay, because every week, someone would be like, well, where's the most updated map? And it's like, okay, do you guys not want me to sleep? And mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so here's, here's a map. And I can easily put that onto a map within minutes after the mural's complete. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, the data was just an added bonus. Um, so I went down there and talked with them in January of 2020 and learned more about the Pixel Sticks app and the mapping and the data. And I could, I, I could really see the value in it of what it could bring to the mural project, not only getting information out to people, it also uh, allows us to activate the murals in a different way than they would normally be activated. Um, the mural plays were, working, were an example of that. We're working with a couple of schools to do add poetry uh, sound clouds to the murals this summer or the spring for poetry month. So it's a really, really neat opportunity to have people see artwork in a different light. Awesome. Awesome. Now, uh, going into, have you talked with individual businesses? Now you, like you mentioned, talking about it, you know, people see it, view it once and then an hour and a half later, they view it again. Have you actually had, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence from businesses yet um, that have maybe seen a different, maybe probably especially yeah. during those mural tours and that sort of thing. But yeah. has there been any of that type of anecdotal evidence where it's actually drumming up? Uh, yeah, uh, I've had business? Kenny at Soggy Bottom, Charlie at, uh, um, uh, what is that? Flint Hard Cider, Dean at, uh, totem books. They've all said that, that that has brought a lot of attention and increased business, uh, probably close to 10% by people coming there and looking at those. I've also had people talk to me about, though, I just heard this lady came to me the other day was telling me that she has a child that has an is immune compromised. And so they're very limited on what they could do during the pandemic and what's going even, even now. And so this was one of their biggest forms of entertainment during the whole pandemic is they would every weekend take a different route and go look at some different murals and check out some of this, check them out. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Joe, uh, for that presentation. And that kind of leads us directly, like you mentioned, in, into uh, the expansion into Grand Blank and, and what else is going on in terms of placemaking and using this type of GIS and data and that sort of thing. So, uh, Christina, uh, if you'd like to share your screen uh, and talk about that. Yes, thank you. I am really excited to be here. Okay, so here in the city of Grand Blanc, we have a lot of placemaking opportunities that we've been able to take full advantage of. So just to start, I think a couple of the first art projects that were kind of done within the city would be this Rust Park um, art wall that is actually in Rust Park right now. It was commissioned back in 2008 by a local artist. He worked with a couple of classrooms at the local elementary, I think it was fifth and sixth grade and they each got a tile and they each got to put something on these tiles. And then these tiles were put onto this wall. There were extra tiles available. So there were a couple of other groups of children that got to kind of participate and get a tile and paint that tile. And this wall is still standing um, and it was you know, built 13 years ago, put up 13 years ago. And it's, it's a beautiful piece in Russ Park. And Russ Park is kind of one of our parks that's a little bit off the beaten path. It's off of Center Road and Russ Park Drive but not a lot of people visit there. So having this there is fantastic because the kids that were part of the original tile art project, they get to come back and they get to see something that they did when they were kids and how fantastic is that to have kind of something to come back to. You're part of history. And I think that was very exciting for them. 
another project that was done in the city, which had full community backing was the painting of the viaduct. So when you're coming down Saginaw Street, you see these giant viaducts and there's railroad tracks over them. They're usually not very appealing to look at. And back in 2015, I think, or thereabouts, they decided to paint it and they kind of did it as a memorial. That's the, you know, the red poppies. That's pretty traditional for that. And there were a lot of volunteers that stepped up in our community and prepped the area, cleaned the area, you know, got it ready for the artist to come in and paint. And it took quite a while for it to get done. But I mean, as you can see, it is a very nice piece of art within our community that everybody sees because Saginaw Street is pretty busy all day, every day. A lot of people go on that road and it's just nice to see something bright that catches your eye that you think, oh, wow, I'm coming to Grand Blank. This is a really nice piece to see when you're you know, coming into the city. So next, let's talk about our events. So there have been many, many events that we have tried over the years to cultivate and try to get public engagement and try to bring the public to us and put on these fantastic events for the community and for surrounding communities. We've you know, done the Tuesday tunes where people are walking from business to business. You know, We really wanted to make sure that we could engage not only our residents and visitors, but also businesses. You know, We want them to be successful here. We want them to wanna to stay here. So for us, that was very important is kind of you know bringing the people to them and where people might not have visited these locations because they didn't know they were there or they just never had a reason to go in. Well, now they're out walking and they're strolling and they're listening to music and it kind of helped bring the people in. We've also tried Festival of Lights, which we still do, which is gonna happen on December 2nd, which is our official tree lighting. Um, just a little side note there. But um, our biggest event, of course, is the Food Truck Festival. That's kind of the event that we've kind of become known for. It's a giant event. There's a lot of food trucks there. It brings a lot of people there. And when we first started this event, um, it was really just about bringing people in the community out, getting them out and about and talking to their neighbors and socializing and something fun for the kids to do, something for the family to do. And we started at the Grand Blank High School. We started with 10 food trucks, which by the end of the night, we figured out was not enough. So I was fortunate enough that we have pictometry um, and part of our GIS here. So I was able to go in, you know, using pictometry has been awesome for me because I can measure the lot. I can figure out how long it is. I know how long my food trucks are. So I can figure out how many food trucks I can get in there. That was critical because when you're out on that lot, it looks huge. <laughs> and you think I can get as many trucks as I want out here. But in reality, you cannot. <laughs> so for me, using the pictometry and being able to measure that was very instrumental in, in me being successful and booking enough food trucks. Right now, we're booking about 20 to 25 food trucks on any okay. given Friday for this event, just to make sure we can meet the demand. I mean, this brings thousands of people out. And you know, we have other areas. You know, it's not just a food truck. We also have a concert that's there. We also try to have something for the kids to do, you know, a kid's craft or a kid's activity, something for them to do. And we really encourage families to come out. We encourage individuals to come out, whoever, just come on out. And, you know, the food trucks are there and they're excited to be there. They, this is one of the events that everybody, everybody looks forward to. So for me this year, it was really important for me to get this event downtown you know, being at the high school is great. And we always encourage people, please visit the downtown, check out our other businesses. There are other things available here. But for me, my ultimate goal is to get everybody into the downtown. I want to get them closer to the downtown. So we moved it to Grand Boulevard and we utilized the Grand Chalet shops for shopping. We've got the food trucks on Grand Boulevard. And then we've got a concert in Physicians Park. It's all within walking distance. We booked a lot of food trucks. Once again, they were crazy busy. But in this instance, people are able to walk a block, maybe two blocks, and they can hit a restaurant if they don't want to wait in line or if, you know, hey, it was fun to walk through, but, you know, I really want to go get some different food. It's within a block. They can visit, you know, six different restaurants. So for us, that was important just to have other opportunities, but another opportunity for people to come downtown, not only to come to our event, but also to see our city and see what we've been able to do. I will tell you that one of the biggest draws is probably that bubble machine. So in the bottom um, 
right hand corner is the bubbles and kids love that thing. It's amazing. It stands there. It shoots bubbles out. Kids come from all directions. So for me, I had to make sure that if I've got that out, I've got enough room because children don't understand <laughs> and they just come running from all directions. So I get on my GIS, I map out my area and I kind of make sure I've got enough room that I can safely have that. I can have a concert going. I can have whatever else I and putting up, but that pictometry and that GIS has been fantastic for me just to be able to map my area so that I can adequately know that I'm not overbooking, I'm not overwhelming people, there's still room to walk, still room to picnic. Uh, so that has been fantastic. Our events are fantastic. Honestly, we're trying more and more. We're always into trying something different, kind of seeing what works. Food Truck Festival has just been really good for us. So that's, you know, one of the highlight events, but we're always willing to try another one. All right, so we've also looked at utility boxes. Um, and the first thing I should probably mention about this, the very first follow-up I always get from people is, how did you get permission to do this? And I have to tell them, these are city owned boxes. I don't need permission. I didn't have to call AT&T or consumers or whoever owns the box and say, hey, can I do this? We own these ones. So it was a little bit easier for us to do. And we partnered with the Grand Blake Arts Council to try to get artists to submit for this. And for us, it was really important to get that public participation, that public engagement and see how the public felt. What do you want to see on these utility boxes? You know, this is not just for us, it's for our community. So we took all the submissions, we printed them out, we took them to our events, we put them out and we had stickers and you could sticker, you know, you could get, I think it was three stickers, you could sticker your top three. And that's kind of how we figured out, okay, these are the top ones, these are the ones that are going up. And we reached out to the artist and said, hey, are you interested in doing this? And these are beautiful. Our DPW did clear coat them, I believe with two coats which was fantastic because these boxes, they were done, I think in 2018, and they're still there. They still look good. And the one cool thing about this is that people call and they say, hey, I saw a utility box. I saw this painted box. Do you have more of those? And we can say, yeah, we do. We've got a list of them. And then they can go all around town and find all nine of them. And it kind of gets you around town because they're not all condensed in one space, but we're only four square miles, but still it gets you out and about and you're looking for something in particular and they really are beautiful. I, I really do enjoy them. I still get a lot of calls from other communities that are asking, how do you implement this? How does this work? And for us, it was, you know, finding the artist, getting the paint and the supplies and getting the location, getting it set. Um, of course, weather is always an issue here in Michigan, <laughs> but for us, it all kind of worked out. I think that summer we only had a couple rainy days, so it wasn't anything too terrible. So for us, this has just been another project that we've done that still looks fantastic and they are well taken care of and people really do enjoy them. They enjoy finding them and going out and seeing them. It's just one more way that we can kind of spruce up something that is typically, I think, gray or green you know, not very exciting to see. Now you drive by them and they pop at you and you go, oh my gosh, look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful eagle. We tried to stick with a the theme. So we did all of them as nature themes. We did ask for one box that was gonna be patriotic and we were gonna put that, you know, right at the corner of Center and Saginaw where the flag is. And that's what the eagle turned out to be. That was our patriotic submission. And they all still look great. They're very vibrant, very nice to look at. All right, so after that, we have the Grand Chalet Shops. These, I don't know if everybody's familiar with, but the Grand Chalet Shops are a fantastic kind of in-between. It helps small businesses. You know, the businesses that are ready to get out of their basement, ready to stop doing craft shows, but not quite ready for a full brick and mortar because there's a lot of overhead and there's a lot of, you know, what ifs. You're signing a giant lease, it's, yes. So for us, we worked with the um, Harding Foundation. Most of this was grant funded. And we were able to do that by working a partnership with the Grand Blank High School. So we had a couple of construction classes and geometry class that actually built these for us as part of one of their projects. And that saved us a lot of money and labor and all of that stuff. And they look great. 
And on top of that, it gives the students a sense of pride because they can come back and they can see. And each one of those actually has a plaque in it from the high school, um, you know, with the class. And these kids can come back and look at it and say, hey, look what I built. And it's still here. And how exciting is that? So for us, that was part of the placemaking was giving these kids a sense of purpose. And they they turned out and they showed up for a couple of grand openings and you could just tell how proud they were. And that was that was quite a, a thing for us to see too. So working those partnerships, looking at the lot, we thought, man, this needs something more, something else. We found a grant for just a small grant. And I thought, hey, we need wings here. <laughs> we need something that'll bring people for a picture, you know, come get a picture with this. This was pretty big at the time, um, doing the wings. And I asked artists to please submit, you know, what you would like to do. And this is what we, we had two artists that came and said, hey, I'd like to do this. And th they look beautiful. And we built the wall. We used a local construction company. We, you know, local materials and all of that. And the wall was built, it was painted, and it looks beautiful. People come, they bring their grandkids, they bring their kids, they get pictures, and it's it's really created a, an additional sense of place for people that were, you know, coming through town and going, oh, what are these, these grand chalet shops, what is this? Oh, what's this mural? This is just, it just adds some kind of beautification to the area. And it was very important for us to really highlight what we're doing, what we're trying to do. We're trying to help the entrepreneurs. We're also trying to help artists, you know. So this was another project that we just thought, wow, this is cool. Let's do this. <laughs> Why not? But um, we definitely used a lot of GIS and a lot of data for this, um, preparing the site, getting it ready. You know, where can I put the wall? How long is the wall going to be? What's going to happen if I make it this way? And of course, consulting everybody on that. So it's nice. It's beautiful. I love looking at it. I love walking out and it's a, it's a beautiful site. So if you haven't been to the Grand Chalet shops or right on Grand Blood Road, right next to City Hall, can't miss them. And then the murals, of course. And we just had one more mural that was completed last night. So I did not get that last one um, pictured here. So you'll just have to come out to the city of Grand Blanc to see it. It's actually on the back. It's on the fence of the fire, the fire station, but it is beautiful. So these are the murals that we had done working with Joe from the Flint um, Public Art Project was amazing. His ability to, he gave us a list of artists and said, hey, tell me what you like. And from that list, we were able to kind of narrow it down. And the, the way that he can book these artists and talk them through the project, and he, he was fantastic for us. So doing this project and having it partially grant funded was huge for us. And again, you know, when we were out looking at these sites, we were trying to get the businesses involved and, hey, who wants a mural? And, you know, what are you thinking? And we kind of liked having the artists to kind of have a little bit of their own uh, leeway, but we also wanted, you know, to have nature scenes or something that was going to be nice for the community and just kind of bring together the two visions, you know, not only ours, but the artists as well. They're very important and they bring their own kind of sense to it. And these are just beautiful. They're all very vibrant. And for the one for the high school, it's actually on asphalt, asphalt. So it's on Jewel Trail, Jewel Trail, sorry. And that was very interesting because I actually got to use pictometry to measure that all out. That was fun <laughs> trying to measure a curved road, but uh, that was very nice. And all the artists that I met with were super friendly, super willing to work with whatever we were trying to get done. And as you can see, they all look very beautiful. And we just tried to pick locations that, yes, we want them to be seen in the community all the time, but we also want you to have to go and search for it. You know, we want to drive our community to go and, you know, discover your town, see what else is there. The two on the bottom right are actually in Russ Park, and that was named after a lieutenant. And it's kind of, we're turning it kind of into a veterans memorial park. And so for us, it's, you know, hey, go visit that park because there's so much there and so many people don't know about it. And so for us to have, you know, we have the tile wall there and now we have this there, there's a little playground and park there as well, but having these little extras, that's what draws the people, that's what brings them out. And that's very important in the community to kind of get people out and about and doing what they do. 
So these murals were fantastic for us. We love them all. They're all very, they're just beautiful. And when you see them in person, it's, and watching them, <laughs> watching them work is fantastic. They all have their own process and each one is different, but they are fantastic. I, I could never do what they do and, and they're great at it. So I'll leave that up to the experts. <laughs> All right, so this, this is the end. So let me just talk about, um, we now have an ice rink and a splash pad in Physicians Park. That's one more way that we're trying to create a sense of place for people. You know, we want you to come and experience the park. The park is fun. It has a playground, which also has a mural in it, thanks to the Grounds Like Arts Council. And they worked with children when they rented a chalet. They worked with children for an entire summer and they made this beautiful mural um, I don't have a very good picture of it, but in the bottom left, you can kind of see between the two red um, playground equipment. It's just, a, it's a beautiful mural and, and children did it and they did it with the help of the Grand Lake Arts Council. And that was very nice. We also have a lot of gardens throughout the city. We've got a Touch the Earth Garden Club that th their volunteers are amazing. They do the flower baskets, they do all the gardens, they do the welcome signs, they do the garden at Center and Saginaw, they do the gardens in Russ Park, the gardens in Physicians Park, the gardens at the Chalet, they do gardens everywhere. And they all look great. They're all very well coordinated and beautiful. And you can really tell how much pride they take in what they're doing just by how great they look. And there's always people out watering. I mean, even today there were people out working and it just really creates that sense of, hey, this is something nice here. We've got nice things going on here. We're really trying to create that sense. We also, this year, um, we also added a Grand Boulevard light show, <laughs> which we did for Halloween. And that actually benefited a local charity, The Fish. And that was fantastic. They had more cars and more donations than they've had in previous years. And now they're gearing up for the holiday season and they'll do a holiday one in December. And that's along Grand Boulevard. And that's just one more thing that we can do to kind of create that sense of place, that sense of, hey, you belong here. This is your community. And that's that was that's been fantastic. And we did utilize pictometry for that a little bit too, just kind of measuring it out and kind of seeing like how big can I make this? You know, where are we at property line wise? One great thing about pictometry is that I can pull it up and sort it by parcel. And I can kind of see like where our property line is <laughs> so that we're not impeding on other people. We want to create these awesome things, but we are also very mindful of property owners and making sure that we're being very respectful of that. So for us, this has just been fantastic. Every partnership that we do is very important to us. And it's important for us to not only have that partnership, but for us to be a good partner too. So everything that we do is always in mind of the community, the residents, what can we do to help more people? What can we do to bring more people? We wanna attract those businesses, but we also need to attract that talent for the businesses. And that's just been kind of part of our, our whole development strategy is just what can we do to bring the people here? Not only to live here, we want you to live, work and play here, but we want you to do everything here. So I think that's it for me. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Uh, just a couple of things I, I thought of just initially is um, one of them is have you talked with, uh, you know, you said you talked to businesses about getting those murals up on, on their buildings and things. Uh, is there any, um, have you talked with them since the murals have gone up? I know it's been very recently, but I don't know if the murals have helped maybe people come to their business more often or uh, I don't know what types of businesses they're murals are on necessarily like you know I know Flint Joe has a quite a few they have quite a few on restaurants and that sort of thing or you know small shops and stuff but I don't know what it is like in Grand, Grand Blank comparatively. I have not talked to any of them personally about what this has done for them but I have had other businesses start calling me and say hey they got a mural I want a mural how do I do that what do I need to do tell me what tell me what to do <laughs> so <laughs> That for us means that it must be somewhat successful because other people want to do it too. So yeah, I haven't talked to the, the couple of businesses that we did use, but I think just driving by them every day, I think they're beautiful. So I'm hoping that they experience some kind of positive traffic from that. Yeah. Yeah. And just for, for those of you that are uh, attending this that don't know what pictometry is, because some of you might not know, it's 
It's a software that's used with it in addition to a, G, a GIS that helps with aerial imagery and looking at oblique aerial imagery that allows for, like Christina mentioned, a lot of measuring, uh, not only distances horizontally, but also some vertical distances uh, of building heights and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a really, really nice piece of software that a lot of government uh, agencies end up using for a lot of their parcels and a lot of their evaluations of properties and, and that sort of thing. So I wanted to make sure, just in case anybody's wondering what, what that meant, um, but I, I'm glad that you're using that type of software to, to allow you to make sure you have the space uh, for your events. Um, another thing was, uh, you know, with Grand Chalets even, you know, once they went in, are people then walking around downtown even more or, you know, visit again, it's all about collecting the data. Now it's tough to collect data at that level. A lot of times when you said you have to go talk individually, but I don't know if you'd heard any anecdotal type evidence, even from that, um, that says, okay, maybe we should either try to think about maybe expanding in the next five years or, you know, that maybe that sort of thing, or um, even, okay, we did something here at this location. Should we do something else? Another location that might draw more support for that region. I know City of Grand Lake's not that large of an area, but um, just just your thoughts on that. Just can I throw out a little information? I just looked it up real quick. Uh, the first mural that was done in Grand Lake, seventy five people have looked at that so far. Wow! So nice. That's not bad for only being up for uh, a couple of months. Yeah, few months. Uh, complete runner. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's got the big blue bobcat on the side. It's well, uh, but um, do, do, I haven't heard anything about the Grand Chalet shops. Like, if they draw traffic at all, um, we have had a couple of that were in the Grand Chalet shops that have now gone on to get their own business. Um, not necessarily in the city of Grand Plank, but in other spots. But I have talked to other business owners that said, hey, whatever you can do to bring people downtown is good for me. Even if it means you know, I suffer that night, it's good for me long term. So anything you can do, we're happy with. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Christina. Thank you. Um, and now we'll go to Damon. Uh, if you'd like just to uh, you know, chat again about what you're doing in, with the Community Foundation and uh, how you're using this type of data and or GIS or what you're thinking in the future if you haven't really implemented it yet. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity to participate. I, uh, you know, I can remember running late for classes in the, uh, the Merchant Science Building and today uh, I was running late for the GIS Zoom uh, panel discussion. So I've come full circle, but not too much has changed. Uh, I, I didn't prepare any slides for all in attendance. I, I knew uh, following Joe, the Flip Public Arts Project, and then Christina with what she does with placemaking and grant link, my slides would probably bore you all. So I'll just, you know, just have a quick discussion and, and field any questions that anyone has. Um, you know, I, as a program officer uh, with Community Foundation, we, we're, I'm in a unique position because we use data uh, not only uh, to uh, identify and support impactful programming, but also to tell that the story of that program to potential funders and donors. Uh, you know, we want to create an atmosphere where organizations that are doing that type of work can build capacity and broaden their reach. The application of data is, is how we get there. Uh, and Neighborhood Small Grants uh, Program is a, a community foundation platform or vehicle, I guess you could say, that we use to get there. Um, our, our awardees are typically smaller uh, grassroots local organizations. So if you were to think about two different uh, platforms of grant making, you have these larger, more established 501c3 entities, and then you also have uh, neighborhood groups, local block clubs, uh, watch, watch groups, faith-based organizations, uh, those who don't have 501c3 status. And then, of course, we do have those traditional organizations. But most of the programming centers around strengthening neighborhood groups, uh, improving neighborhood conditions, creating safe neighborhoods, uh, opportunities to connect, community engagement, outdoor spaces. And I know that sounds really broad and conceptual, but how do we use data and, and geographic information? Uh, that's a great question. That's why we're all here. Uh, we, we begin collecting data in all, in all iterations of our grant site. So when we're in the application stage, uh, we ask these potential grantees, have you previously been funded uh, through neighborhood small grants? 
What are the geographic boundaries of your project? What are your attendance projections? Uh, during the execution of that project, we collect data. During a midpoint check-in, we, we work with different, uh, we've had placement with uh, interns through the Flint Community Initiative. So we were able to dive really deep this past uh, year and collect that data and try to apply it, especially during uh, the programming. So, uh, you know, have you had any, any sort of, of challenges? Um, are there any budget deficits or surplus issues? You got any new, new partnerships? And then, of course, upon completion of the program, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a final report that the grantees would have to submit. Uh, one of the things that we look for in that, that final report, obviously, outside of, of budget reconciliation and, uh, you know, how many community members served or, or what type of attendance did you have, uh, we'd also like to measure uh, if, so I'll give you an example. If we know that a, a porch fest uh, block party that we had on Russet Court uh, on the north side of Flint had 300 attendees, then I'll know that that's an opportunity for even greater wraparound services or placemaking. Hey, could we do a vaccination event? Could we do uh, voter registration or health screening uh, at these types of events? the next year when that organization comes back. Uh, that's important too, because NSGP has three different award tiers uh, with different amounts, right? So you'll have the traditional, which is a smaller award. You'll have the next level, a little bit larger. And then you have transformational, which is a $25,000 award. What we expect to see is organizations move through uh, those tiers as they execute their program. So we'd like to see those groups grow as they continue to apply and, and then seek support uh, for funding. Uh, for example, uh, last year we had 49, uh, 49 uh, awardees, I'm sorry, 41 awardees, right? Eight of those were denied. Of those awardees, uh, we broke it down into the segments and what they were awarded, right? So you had 19 traditional uh, 21 next level, and then there was only one transformational brand, which is how it should look on the front end with those smaller organizations. You should have, uh, you know, a, a good amount. You should have a sizable, uh, larger amount of folks who were awarded that mid-level, next level award, and then a, a, even smaller as you get through the traditional grants, because as those organizations grow in their capacity, they're no longer going to be seeking funding from neighborhood small grants. They'll go the traditional route that some of those larger 501c3 organizations go. Um, again, we, we, we collect the data not just to uh, you know evaluate the program efficacy or uh, steward you know stewardship of the budget, but we'd also like to have those uh, you know those creative placemaking opportunities and organizational growth. Uh, we also conducted the neighborhood inventory uh, where we'll work with the city of Flint. Uh, we'll have different organizations who will take a certain parcel of land designated by city planning, uh, whether that be, you know, a block radius or uh, different geographical boundaries, and they'll literally tell us what we need. Hey, we've got uh, damaged walkways here, uh, street signage, lighting, safety issues, fencing, that sort of thing. We collect that data through tablets that we distribute to these neighborhood organizations, go back to the city. And then the city uses that as an indicator to drive uh, their work in improving neighborhood infrastructure. So again, uh, you know, we haven't necessarily begun with some of the, the more advanced level GIS uh, capabilities, but the resources that we have and the way that we apply the data really drives the work that we do. Uh, so again, any questions anyone has? I, I knew I wouldn't be able to compete with the, the slides from Joe and Christina, but I'm happy to talk if you guys would like me to do that. Yeah, and uh, David hit on a good, very good point, especially with the, all those smaller, you know, neighborhood grants. I participated with uh, uh, on the Census 2020 outreach project that uh, the Community Foundation did, where they handed out uh, a lot, it seemed, uh, of small grants to community neighborhood organizations that then could hold these events. Now, granted, the, the pandemic threw a wrench in a lot of that. Uh, but a lot of these neighborhood organizations, even though they weren't able to truly hold the events they wanted to, they still were able to get a lot done and get the word out. And not only would they, with these events, would they 
you know, talk about the census, but it'd be paired with something else. Uh, like, like Damien was mentioning, you know, in the future, they're okay, we'll, we'll bring something else in with this event because we're getting a lot of people. Uh, and Lynn's <laughs> looks like he's taking a peek, but, uh, and, you know, it, that type of stuff, we use mapping a lot for that. And just for you guys, you know, at the Community Foundation, we help map where those grantees were located, then where those events were located to make sure that we're, uh, as a, from a programming perspective, where uh, we weren't missing anywhere sort of thing. And that's something that I know you guys have looked into and want to do in the future. At least talking yeah. with, you know, Sue was uh, Sue Peters, who works at the Community Foundation, was on our earlier session today. And she's always been a proponent of, of that type of thing, which uh, based on how you're talking, Damon, that you're the exact same way. Yeah. Also, I would like yeah, we, we, I, Joe doesn't know this, but I'll, I'll give you another example. I feel like I just stepped in. We're getting ready to say something, Joe. I was just going to say, Flynn Public Art Project is one of those programs yep. that has worked up through that system. Yep, exactly. And the foundation has always been a big supporter of the Public Art Project. Yeah, I was going to add, uh, you know, Joe doesn't know this, but just coming off the heels of this presentation, we've had some internal conversations about using Pixel 6 data to drive where we're going to have community events and where we would encourage folks uh, to do some programming. So which of those murals are the most popular? What gets the most views? What gets the most traffic? We'd like to apply that to some of our grant making uh, in the future, 2022 specifically. So I guess... There's a bullet point for you, Joe. You didn't know what was happening, but we do use, uh, uh, you know, data in that way. Everyone wants to, you know, there's there's some fantastic programs. There's some fantastic pro projects. Everyone really wants to uh, do something meaningful and impactful, and it's very difficult at times to, to make that. I don't necessarily want to say a competitive process, but not everyone's project will get funded. Uh, one of the ways that we can eliminate that is by using this data from the outcomes of these projects and going back to those potential funders and say, look at the impact that we've had, look at what we've had to deny uh, or reject because we didn't have the resources and support and using that data, look what we could, what we could do. So the front end, the midpoint, then of course, what everyone dreads about a, a grant, the reporting cycle, we try to turn that into a positive and use it to, to grow the program. And also I would want to say, we are talking about the pixels text. Um, so we were going to do it this year, but with the pandemic, we we kind of we're holding on till next year. But everything is in place to do a scavenger hunt with the murals uh, with the Pixel Sticks app. So there is there's a bunch of small stencils projects out throughout the city of Flint. Are mostly most of them downtown. And there's also if you look on the back of these some of the buildings, there's these little gold coin looking things. Um, that can be programmed where we could say there's an entry point in Soggy Bottom and you go into Soggy Bottom and you click onto that entry point and it gets you into the scavenger hunt. And so then it gives you clues. So there's a couple of ways we've talked about doing it. One, we talked about doing a drag queen scavenger hunt where the drag queen would give you the clues to the next, next one. And then at the end, you'd win prizes or whatever it is. Um, get people to interact with the murals and be interact with the businesses of downtown also. But when people this year we were going to do it, but with partial capacities and everything going on, we didn't want to overwhelm businesses with people coming in to look for a scavenger hunt. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's next year we'll be able to implement that too. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. Well, thank you to you guys. Uh, if there's any questions. Uh, please just uh, pop them in the Q and A, uh, and while if anybody's doing that or thinking of it, um, I want to I'll share this just one more time. I I, uh, I shared. I have all the emails uh, for the for the people that are on here um, with Joe and uh, Christina and Damon. Uh, if you have any questions after that, uh, but uh, again, you'll have a post event survey uh, coming out. Uh, tomorrow with the email. Um, I'm, oh, 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 there we go. There we are. <laughs> uh, I'm putting the the event in, or the survey in the chat um, right now. Uh, if you want to just click it now and, and fill it out, it just takes a couple minutes. That'd be great for us and gives us feedback uh, that I'll share with our, our guests. Um, and again, if you fill it out, you're entered in the drawing uh, to get that personal use license um, uh, for free for a year. Uh, 
It doesn't look like we have uh, anything currently. So I would like to thank again, Joe, Christina, and Damon for joining us, taking the time out of your day to help us celebrate uh, GIS Day um, and look at GIS and data from, from a different perspective than most people might think that you can use it. Um, again, if you have any questions, please just reach out to me at any point. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.